Casting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at computeramerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at computeramerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, how you doing? Welcome back onto the program. Uh, hopefully you're doing well and you are ready for some Computer America. We are doing computer and technology news and uh, we have tons of stories, tons of things to talk about. And hey, we're going to keep you up to date on what's happening out there in the tech world. So with that being said, everyone, welcome into the program. First things first, ComputerAmerica.com. That will be everything, including where to find us, how to find us, uh, video, show notes, uh, past shows, future shows, everything that we do here on Computer America. You can find out more at our website at ComputerAmerica.com. Be sure to check out the video portion. But hey, of course, we definitely appreciate it if you listen to us live on IRN. So all that and more here on Computer America. Let's go ahead and get started with today's computer and technology news. So I think the first biggest one, if you uh, if you hadn't heard about this, well, you're about to, and it's a big one. It's very, very big. So obviously, uh, it's not quite on the scale of... Um, of, of Equifax with its 147 million that were affected. And by the way, just want to really harp on that. Be sure to go and check to see if you were affected by that data breach. You definitely want to, uh, you know, uh, sign up for some credit monitoring or have credit mon monitoring pri provided for you by Equifax. Or of course, get that uh, you know get that settlement of like 125 bucks plus like another like 200 if you decide to uh, catalog any time that you spent dealing with the actual leak. But uh, yeah, so this isn't on the scale of 147 million, but this is close. This is uh, this is pretty big, and it's just payment information. Of, I say just payment information. It's just your money, folks. But hey, it's something where this according to business insider although it's been reported all over uh of course speaking to the fact that uh, yeah capital one capital one had a uh was found out about or, i'm sorry capital one found out about its 106 million customer data breach only because a member of the public of the public emailed in a tip there you go so there, and they mentioned, uh, you know, they, they have a link to the GitHub repository that has all the kind of stuff. And yeah, it looks like the only reason that they found out about this was because a good Samaritan actually pointed it out to the company. Uh, not always does the company, you know, find out about this. They, it's very hard to proactively investigate the entirety of the internet and the entirety of the dark web for any kind of security breaches. But this was one of the bigger ones. Uh, and it's uh, actually, they just found out about it, uh, about, let's see, uh, they said that uh, they found out about it about June, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, July 17th, so about two weeks ago, and now we are finally hearing about it. And we actually, uh, according to another article that we're going to do right after this one, we actually have an ID on who 
was actually the one to compromise all of this data. So it, uh, it gets more interesting. But let's go ahead and get started with the, with the obvious. Capital One was made aware of its enormous data breach by someone who emailed the company after seeing details of the hack freely available online. The American bank announced Monday that it had been breached and it was affecting some 106 million people in the United States and Canada. Many of those people had social security numbers, linked bank accounts, and other personal information compromised. Yeah, it, this one this one's pretty bad. This is uh, this is going to go up there with uh, with some of the worst. And by the way, uh, we'll probably most likely definitely talk about this tomorrow with uh, with our cybersecurity expert Scott Schober. So be sure to tune in for that for his expert opinion on it. But let's go ahead and talk about this now, saying that the Department of Justice has arrested Paige A. Thompson, a former software engineer, and charged her with a single count of computer fraud and abuse. Hmm. The DOJ said that the breach took place sometime between March and July. A criminal complaint accused her of stealing the data from Capital One's cloud provider and posting details of it of the hack on GitHub, a project managing site popular among developers. Those details included various commands that Capital One later verified could be used to obtain its data, according to a complaint. So I guess there you go. That's how it was done. Uh, looks like someone who was working with uh, the cloud environment that Capital One utilizes to manage, you know, uh, personal details, uh, you know, personal information. Looks like they go, went ahead and posted those online so that anyone could then go in and retrieve the information. The complaint also includes the detail that Capital One didn't realize it had been hacked until it was tipped off. And they have the email here. If you're watching the video portion, you can see the email itself, uh, you know, kind of how it happened one o'clock in the morning on July 17th, saying that there appears to be some leaked S3 data on yours on GitHub. Uh, let me know if you need help tracking them down as the email reads. It's very interesting. So they mentioned that the GitHub file was timestamped April 21st. It was linked to Thompson's name. So... Not exactly the smartest criminal, although I don't think this was a matter of, like, the fact that they only charged her with one count of uh, fraud and, let's see, what was the account again? Or, uh, let's see, they, <laughs> here we go. Uh, they have charged her with a single count of computer fraud and abuse. So, computer fraud and abuse, I don't know what kind of sentence that carries with it, what kind of penalty, fees, fines, jail time, what she could possibly possibly be staring down, but for compromising 100 million people, it kind of leads me to believe this was a developer who was using a public resource and didn't, uh, didn't properly vet her permissions and just, you know, kind of accidentally leaked how to act, how to access uh, personal information through Capital One. Now, uh, obviously, you can see the screenshot as we mentioned. Uh, they said they said in a statement, Capital One described the person as an external security researcher. Happens off happens often. So, it is common for companies to find out about data breaches in this manner. Capital One has an email address in which people can flag suspected vulnerabilities in its systems. Many other banks have channels like this, which you can see where this uh, you know, where this email was sent to was responsible disclosure at CapitalOne.com. So, if you're interested in this, there you go. Uh, some of the people who emailed the hotline are white hat or ethical hackers or experts in the cybersecurity. Uh, realm who report security vulnerabilities to their owners rather than trying to exploit them based on capital one's description that may have been the case so thompson was was uh was, is due to appear in court this thursday if convicted she faces up to five years in prison and two hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine and like i said we have a follow-up story to this one where let's see um hmm where did it go here, here we go uh this so that was an article from uh, business insider and this is one from ars technica kind of a follow-up to this saying that uh the hacker has been id'd as a former amazon employee who steals data of 106 million people from capital one so we mentioned this how it happened and that kind of thing so let's go ahead and talk about you know kind of what happened here uh 
so the article is you know pretty in depth. They mentioned uh, you know the the defendant, Paige A. Thompson, 33, Seattle, was an employee of Amazon Web Services. FBI Special Agent Joel Martini wrote in a criminal complaint filed on Monday that a GitHub account belonging to to Thompson contained evidence that earlier this year someone exploited a firewall vulnerability in Capital One's network that allowed an attacker to execute a series of commands on the bank servers. And of course, those commands can be everything from, uh, you know, print out all of your data, uh, save all the data to, to another server, or, you know, even a man in the middle attack and just, hey, uh, check with this before you do uh, anything else. So, or at least continuously offload your data to this third party server that belongs to us. Uh, Capital One has confirmed the intrusion, and like they said, 100 million individuals' personal information includes names, incomes, dates of birth, addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses. Social security numbers for 140,000 people were also obtained, and about 80,000 bank account numbers were accessed. That's a lot. Uh, they also mentioned social, social insurance numbers for about 1 million Canadians. No credit card numbers or login credentials were compromised because, thank goodness, I guess. Uh, the data came from credit card applicants filed uh, from 2005 through early 2019. Customer status data, such as credit scores, credit limits, balances, payment history, and more were, of course, uh, taken. They said it's unlikely the stolen data was used in fraud or widely disseminated, bank officials said, probably because it was so recent and, hey, uh, yeah. But here's the thing. Uh, unless you change your address, your email address, your phone, your date of birth, your uh, your social security number, that data is out there. And they may have been, a, you know, they may have tried to pull it down, but... If someone caught one of it before they took it off of GitHub, that's going to be backed up and that's going to be, uh, you know, spread amongst everyone once again in just a matter of time. That once the information is out there, it's very, very hard to get that genie back in the bottle. So they mentioned that one command executed in the firewall hack allowed the intruder to gain credentials for an administrator known as uh, asterisk WAF role. This in turn enabled access to bank data stored under contract by a cloud computing company that went unnamed in core documents, but was identified as Amazon Web Services by the New York Times and Bloomberg. Where, if you think about it, there's only Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure Cloud, and uh, Google Web Services, and well, uh, whatever Google's Web Services uh, equivalent is. There's only so many uh, that could service a customer as large as Capital One. So... Amazon, indeed. Other commands allowed the attacker to enumerate Capital One folders stored on Amazon Web Services and to copy their contents, IP addresses, and other evidence ultimately indicted, uh, I'm sorry, indicated that Thompson was the person who exploited the vulnerability and posted the data to GitHub. So not only was, uh, so earlier I thought that maybe this was a developer who uh, was storing confidential you know uh, security sensitive information on you know in, in a public place uh no looks like looks like she's actually the one who uh, found the vulnerability and was exploiting said vulnerability for everyone else's benefit uh thompson uh thompson allegedly used tor and a vpn from iPredator in an attempt to cover her tracks at the same time martini said that much of the evidence tying her to the intrusion came directly from the thing she posted on social media or put in direct messages. Hmm. A June 26 Slack posting and another post the next day to an unnamed service, for instance, both refer to the WAF role account. In response to a June 27 post, someone told her, uh, sketchy, don't go to jail, please. Using the handle erratic, she responded, and they actually, and she actually has uh, her response here, Saying that uh, you know all of her all of her ways that she's trying to protect herself, uh, including I Predator Tor S3 on all this. I want to get it off my server. That's why I'm archiving all of it. It's all encrypted. I just don't want it around though. I gotta find somewhere to store it. That's Info Blocks CTO. One is interesting. They have greater than 500 Docker containers. So she knew what she was doing, for sure. This is this is not an accident. This was. Very much done, done on purpose. 
Uh, yeah, so the unnamed receiver of these messages sent them to Capital One officials. Capital One officials also received an email on July 17th saying, hey, uh, you were compromised. So again, uh, maximum penalty, five years, $250,000 fine. And once again, we have a 100 million plus uh, compromise of personal information out there all over again. Although this one with Capital One, I'm, I'm sure that they've been compromised before, but this is probably going to go down as one of the largest they will have, uh, at least to date. Now, let's go ahead and continue on. Tons more articles, ton, tons more. And I'm actually pretty curious about this. Uh, I did not get a chance to... Uh, you're going to understand why the word vet is probably appropriate here. I did not really get a chance to vet this particular uh, article. But I did want to... Uh, to talk about it because the headline was so gripping. I don't know what else to say about it. <sighs> oh, yep, and yeah, there we go. So check this one out. <sighs> this one from The Independent, and they're saying that human-animal hybrids to, to be developed in Japan after ban controversially lifted. That's right, human-animal hybrids. I'm not saying this is the worst thing in the world. It could be worse. But the the benefit you, you can definitely see where the benefits come in come into play. Obviously, you don't want some kind of homunculus, uh, weird thing that's just going to have an existence of endless suffering. No, no one wants that. But if you're able to bring animals, either you know, for a couple of reasons, closer to humans, then maybe you could uh, better test for pharmaceuticals. You could. Uh, have transplants you know obviously right now we use uh you know we use pigs and things like that for human transplants sometimes uh pig hearts and whatnot if we can make them closer to humans and make them more compatible with human bodies then hey there's a way to um you know kind of answer a crisis of a shortage of uh vital organs but there's a right way and a wrong way to go about this let's figure this out in japan Saying, and again, from the independent.co.uk, human animal hybrids are to be developed in embryo form in Japan after the government approved controversial stem cell research. Human cells will be grown in rats, there you go, in rat and mouse embryos, then brought to term in a surrogate animal as part of an experiment to be carried out at the University of Tokyo. Supporters say the work, led by renowned geneticist uh, Hiromitsu. Nakauchi. I'm sure I butchered that. Uh, this, uh, so a renowned geneticist could be a vital first step towards eventually growing organs that could then be transplanted into people as needed, which, as I was just saying, would be very helpful if you have kidney, if you have lung, if you have heart, if you have, uh, you know, uh, any any kind of uh, vital organ failure, if you could just grow one and, uh, you know, in a pig or something like that, and have it implanted, and it would be a perfect match for you, that would be incredibly revolutionary when it comes to medicine. But opponents have raised concerns about the scientists are playing God. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it's just like stem cell research uh, used to be, you know, back in the day when the only time they could access stem cells was from, uh, were, were from uh, uh, fetal tissue. Very, very controversial. I, I recall that very well, uh, hearing about, you know, is this right to take a life in order to, um, you know, preserve another uh, preserve another life? Is, is experimenting like this really worth it? But eventually we found a way around that because we were able to take stem cells and create them from reverse engineered red blood cells and what have you. Uh, that's no longer really an issue because we don't gather stem cells from, uh, you know, from fetal tissue anymore. Great. Now, we're having a similar kind of fight, or at least we're heading towards a similar kind of fight, because eh, mixing, mixing uh, animals and humans can get a little weird. They worry that human cells could stray beyond the targeted organs into other areas of the animal, effectively creating a creature that is part animal, part person. Although, to be fair, to be fair, I, you know, whenever I hear about this kind of thing, uh, what happens more often 
instead of getting some weird science fiction-y creature that's half mouse, half human, I would assume uh, something that looks like Mickey Mouse, instead of getting something that would be half mouse, half human, it would be more that the fetus would be uh, non-viable. And the the organism would just would not be able to live. Uh, there's very, very little chance that uh, that something grown like this, if it's not a if it's not a good hybrid, if it's not, uh, I guess, if one part of the hybrid is not accepted by the other, odds are it's just not going to work. It's not. It's not going to create this weird, horrible organism. It's just. It just won't even become an organism in the first place. So the article continues. For that reason, such prolonged experimentation has been effectively banned or gone unfinanced across the world in recent years. Uh, scientists were forbidden from going beyond a 14-day growth period in Japan, but those laws were relaxed in March when the country's Education of Science Ministry, uh, I'm sorry, Education and Science Ministry issued new guidelines saying that such creatures could now be brought to term. Uh, they said that the application to experiment is the first to be approved under the new framework and saying that we don't expect to create human organs immediately. But this allows us to advance our research based upon the know-how we have gained up until this point. Hmm. He added that he plans to proceed slowly and will attempt to bring any hybrid embryos to term for some years, rather growing the hybrid mouse embryos to 14.5 days. Because obviously, if you were banned from uh, taking anything beyond 14 days, the next step is to go to 14 and a half days. Uh, that, you know one step at a time and they also mentioned uh where when the animal when animals organs are mostly formed and the hybrid rat embryos to 15.5 days there you go uh such caution is welcomed by bioethicists in the country it's going to be it, it, it's good to proceed with caution uh here's a quote from the science policy researcher uh it will make it possible to have a dialogue with the public which is feeling anxious and has concerns but like i said this is not so much about creating horrible, horrible monstrosities in, uh, you know, in a lab setting. No, this is more about perfecting that ability to grow organs in other animals that are would be suitable for human transplant, and doing so in an ethically sound way. There's a way to do it. You just can't rush to it. Uh, if nothing else, the the quotes, the literature, what I'm kind of reading here from Japan are much more encouraging than the than the route that China has taken with its CRISPR and its quote unquote rogue scientists who I still hold very, uh, very much to my heart that it was not a rogue scientist, but rather a state sponsored scientist that they could then say was rogue. But um, yeah, the realm of science is getting very... Uh, very interesting. Very interesting. So let's go ahead and continue on. Uh, how about we talk about... Okay, just real quick. We have time to do this before the break. Uh, and this one is interesting. It's interesting because it blends that oh-so-familiar and favorite topic lately of politics and technology. That's right. <sighs> this is probably a bad thing. That's just my personal take on it. So let's go ahead and get into this. A new bill would ban autoplay videos and endless scrolling, taking aim at features that are designed to be addictive. This is by McKenna Kelly. This is from The Verge. And yeah, snap streaks, YouTube autoplay, and endless scrolling are all coming under fire from a new bill which is sponsored by Senator Josh Hawley, uh, a Republican from Missouri. Uh, yeah, Missouri. Uh, I think, MO? MO is Missouri, right? I don't even know. Okay, targeting the tech industry's addictive design. Hawley's Social Media Addiction Reduction Technology Act, or SMART Act, because everything has to have an acronym. And again, because I read that kind of fast, Social Media Addiction Reduction Technology Act would ban these features that work to keep users on platforms longer, along with others like Snapstreaks that incentivize the continued use of these, product, uh, of these products. If approved, the Federal Trade Commission and Health and Human Services could create similar rules that would expire after three years unless Congress codified them into law. 
And here's the quote from the senator. Big tech has embraced a business model of addiction. Too much of the innovation in this space is designed to uh, not to create better products, but to capture more attention by using psych psychological tricks that make it difficult to look away. So, uh, yeah, let's get a little bit further and then we'll uh, you know kind of take our spin on this. But deceptive design played an enormous part in last week's FTC settlement with Facebook and Holly's bill would make it unlawful for tech companies to use dark patterns to manipulate users into opting into services. For example, accept and decline checkboxes would need to be in the same font, format, and size to help users make better, more informed choices. So obviously, he is targeting a lot of these things here that are uh, really uh, deceptive design. And, you know, like you said, autoplay videos, snap streaks, uh, you know, the fact that sometimes decline checkboxes are much more obscure or uh, buried in the fine print as opposed to accept, which is usually, you know, front and center, or even deceptively worded so that you think you're declining, but really you're accepting the policy. Uh, I've seen them all. Trust me, there's a, there's a million different ways to get people to click OK instead of no. But it looks like he's trying to target this from a design point of view. So here's my problem with it. My problem with this whole thing is that where where does it end? Because it's very easy for a senator to pick on the tech industry. The tech industry is definitely worth picking on. Like we mentioned, uh, there is the uh, the Department of Justice and the antitrust uh, investigation that they're starting up uh, about monopolistic practices, about them being too uh, you know too powerful, having you know having really tentacles in just too many parts of our society. Looking at you. Uh, really just the main tech companies, uh, such as Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, what have you. Now, there's a lot to pick up, there, there's a lot to pick on, but here's my problem. When it comes to other industries, they have been regulated like crazy. And I'm thinking in my head right now about like, let's say the gambling, uh, the gambling uh, economy. I guess, or I should say the gambling industry is highly regulated. You know, you can't gamble until you're 21. You're uh, not even allowed on the, uh, on the premises unless you're over 21. Uh, essentially, they create games that are much in the same way, but they're also regulated very strictly about odds and how often you can win and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and of course, there's a huge outreach on, uh, into gambling addiction, that if you have a gambling addiction problem, you, there are places that you can go out and get help. Uh, addiction in the form of tech, uh, tech addiction is slowly gaining traction. You know, people who are legitimately just too addicted to technology as we know it, uh, that's getting better and better, but we're not there yet. So anyways, all that aside, what I was trying to get at was that Banning autoplay videos and banning uh, snap streaks or banning these things that make content more easily consumable. You can try that, but there's always going to be another trick that they can pull out of their sleeve. Hampering, th hampering this type of, uh, I don't know, ham hampering this type of design is not going to stop the end result tech companies are still going to figure out a way to actually uh, keep users on their platform continuously. Also, they mentioned uh, things like endless scrolling. I mean, users are just kind of prone to that. And then on top of that, I get that you want to pick on the tech industry, but what about, let's take, for instance, maybe the grocery store. Let's say the uh, you know, uh, your typical grocery store, supermarket, where you have the illusion of choice. It's kind of underhanded to say that, hey, look at all this choice that you have, when in reality, there's only about four to five companies that provide all the products that you're looking at, even though they're under a dozen different brands or two dozen different brands, you think that you have competition, you think that you're getting a good, a, a good deal, you think that you are, you know, that you kind of have that brand loyalty, uh, subconsciously, you think you're getting a better deal because you're going with this one instead of that one. But in reality, it's just these companies are 
using psychological tricks to think that you have competition, to think that you are getting a better deal, but really all of the money eventually flows to the same place. Why aren't practices like that being taken, being, being taken into consideration? Why is it that tech companies with their ability to keep users on their platform for a longer period of time, and trust me, screen time, a huge, hugely important metric for when it comes to, uh, to shareholders, stockholders, things like that. The amount of time that people spend on their platform uh, is highly monitored. Why is it that we're only looking at the tech industry when every industry in the country, in, in the world, every industry in the world uses some form of social, sorry about that, some form of social psychology to make sure that they stay on top. Hey, we're going to continue on as uh, we go to break. Everyone, we'll be right back. More Computer America right after this. Everyone, stay tuned. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 minutes past the hour. And ladies and gentlemen, if you miss any part of today's program, check out Apple Podcasts, check out uh, iHeartRadio, or anywhere else that, uh, that well, of course, podcasts are heard, uh, the Google Play Store as well. If uh, you'd like to hear today's program, if you miss any part of it or any of our past shows, of course, they should all be available wherever podcasts are heard. So be sure to check that out. Uh, hey, we continue on. We are right in the middle of this uh, Social Media Addiction Reduction Technology Act, or really the senator's personal crusade on getting big tech away from its addictive methodology or its addictive practices to, uh, as he says, by using psychological tricks that make it difficult to look away. Really, isn't that the same thing that you have with uh, cliffhangers? Isn't that the same thing that you have with, um, you know, television shows? Isn't that the same thing that you have with uh, newspapers, magazines, articles? Making sure that you just flip one more page that you need to check out the story on page 32, even though the, the uh, you know, kind of the introduction to the article is on page one. So make sure that you kind of flip everything in between. Isn't, aren't the psychological tricks as he calls them isn't that part of every industry known to man it's just human nature and if you're going to compete in a marketplace that others are going to do it better than you are then you're you have to do it too it's uh 
it's pretty interesting how how he's targeted tech companies for this. So he mentioned that social media companies uh, deploy a host of tactics designed to manipulate users in a way that undermines their well-being, and that is uh, and that of course is the campaign for a commercial-free childhood. At a hearing late last month, senators heard from a panel of experts on persuasive tech. Tristan Harris, a formal Google design ethicist, explained how platforms create products to increase the amount of time users spend on a site, saying that if I take the bottom out of this glass and you keep refilling it with water or the wine, you won't know when to stop drinking. That's what happens with infinitely scrolling feeds. So some companies like Apple have already have tools to help trackers track or help users track how much time they're spending on different apps. If this bill were to become law, social media companies would be required to implement similar tools where users can track across all their devices a user owns. So here's the thing. Autoplay and things like that, there are convenience because if you sit down to watch, let's say, YouTube videos and it's your life, it's your free time, if you have budgeted yourself 30 minutes to play or I'm, I'm sorry, to watch YouTube videos, hey, autoplay can be a very uh, helpful feature if you're just watching in the background passively. Uh, keeps you from having to do that. It, it's, a, it's a usability feature, and yes, it can cause uh, some people to watch YouTube videos for longer than they're supposed to, but that's kind of up to personal responsibility, that you know that, hey, I only have 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes uh, to watch videos on YouTube, uh, even though they autoplay, it's still up to the individual to determine that, hey, it's now time for me to stop watching. I, it, it doesn't matter if it's still playing in the background. You can always come back to it. It's, uh, it, it's as much a usability and kind of a convenience as it is trying to get you addicted. And on top of that, I mean, let's just face it. Um, it's just how tech companies... Are kind of set up that they will get you to continuously use their products um, it if anything I said personal responsibility a, a few times and I really do stand behind that it just feels like this should be something that should be about education I'm completely for the idea that uh, all of these services decide that um, hey we're going to show you how much time that you're spending here so that people can make more informed decisions with their time if they decide that after seeing the information that these tech companies have collected on them and they said that you know i just spent eight hours this week watching uh, you know watching youtube which really isn't that much or if i spend 50 hours this week watching youtube maybe that's excessive maybe i need to pull it back uh, but it shouldn't be up to others to to design in a way that keeps that keeps me from enjoying the platform like purposely handicapping these these companies is not the answer personal responsibility and education and the idea that hey uh <laughs> that you should that you should be in control of what you do and if you want to talk about overreach or at least government overreach i feel like this is kind of one of those ways um yeah, I, I had another point in mind, but I currently, you know, kind of flew out of my head. It's just, I find it very, very, very strange that a bill would be introduced to combat endless scrolling. Um, introduce more plans that would help with the, uh, you know, with the mental, with the mental side effects of addiction and take social media addiction and technology addiction more seriously, uh, mental, health, uh, mental health services, things like that, uh, more information for the individual consumer about how you're actually using these platforms, but overall actually restricting someone and saying, hey, you're not, you're not allowed to have an autoplay video. Um, yeah, it, it just seems like you are attacking the problem from the wrong end. So there you go. Uh, let's hope that doesn't go anywhere, but we continue on tons and tons and tons of different articles. And how about we talk about this one? So farewell direct TV. Now, if you don't recall, direct TV was purchased by AT&T. Uh, and from that, 
little amalgamation, you ended up with DirecTV Now, where you could get your DirecTV programming to, uh, to stream anywhere online. Essentially, you have an active DirecTV uh, setup, and you can anywhere that you had uh, either an AT&T hotspot or Wi-Fi, you could then stream your content to your phone. Very simple and, hey, a nice way to blend your services. I mean, the, if you have satellite TV, you could watch it anywhere on the go. Think HBO Go and things like that. Now, here we go. Uh, you, and this is for an article from Engadget, Mr. John Fingus, saying that you'd be forgiven if you were befuddled by AT&T's range of streaming services. Between DirecTV Now, HBO Max, Watch TV, and now AT&T TV, which I personally think should have been called AT&T TV, uh, it's not always clear what service will meet your needs or even which app you might need. The telecom thinks it can simplify things a bit, well, maybe. As part of a summer trials for its satellite TV substitute, AT&T TV, it's rebadging DirecTV Now as an AT&T TV, AT TV Now and folding service into the same AT&T TV app. Uh, you'll have just one place to go, whether you're a cord cutter looking for a lean TV package or just looking for an alternative to satellite. Because if you didn't know, um, yeah, AT&T is probably looking for a way to get rid of satellite TV. It's just not as profitable. It's very expensive. And yes, they took it over. But uh, I don't. I, I think that ideally, AT and T is looking for a way to fold Directv users into its its other existing arms of of its company. Which, by the way, to uh, to further elaborate on that, or to further opine on that topic, that's why these mega mergers and trust me, Directv and AT and T uh, combining was definitely a mega merger. That's why these mega mergers don't always work out when it comes to uh, increasing competition, because right now you can kind of see where due to rebranding efforts or the ability of DirecTV to actually offer good service to uh, to people without further infrastructure investments, at and is looking to just absorb DirecTV customer base and get rid of everything that used to be DirecTV as a competitor. Uh, so the app will be available sometime in the coming weeks and existing customers will see a change take effect automatically through software updates. More details will be coming when the rollout starts in earnest. This does, uh, this does save you the trouble of downloading yet another app and it's more consistent with at and strategy. DirecTV Now doesn't have much to do with satellite TV, so why pretend otherwise? However, the added simplicity doesn't necessarily translate to clarity. Two services in one app might be confusing depending on the execution. And John Fingus continues, one thing's for certain, the this diminishes the power of the DirecTV brand. Because obviously, if uh, you had your obvious DirecTV brand with the satellite TV, and you had your DirecTV Now, which was your uh, your subscription-based service, you know, kind of on your phone, and you just take away half of the name brand, there you go. So while there's no evidence that the core DirecTV service is going away, you won't see the name if you're only interested in streaming. That could be a significant in an era where at t is rapidly bleeding conventional TV customers, mentioning, and here in the article they mentioned about 778,000 in the second quarter alone, and will increasingly depend on internet video as a cornerstone of its business. So there you go. It's, uh, yeah, it, it really does feel like DirecTV as a company is starting to go away and will eventually be completely absorbed. And if satellite TV sticks around, which there are some customers who only have access to satellite TV, if satellite TV sticks around, it will be completely and totally rebranded as AT&T one day, eventually. DirecTV is probably, is probably going away. Now, there's that article. We have time for a couple more, and let's go ahead and continue on. Uh, how about we discuss Facebook? And this is Facebook admitting up front and very, very clearly that there is still work to do, which is good to hear because it's very much true. 
Facebook fact checker says that more work is needed to curb fake news. UK organization Full Fact wants more transparency from the company. Makes sense. Uh, they said that uh, Facebook knows its platform is awash with fake news. And since December 2016, after facing, after facing criticism about its failure to stem the spread of fake news in the run-up to the presidential election, the company has been working with a number of fact-checking firms in a bid to review and debunk false information on the site. One such firm, UK fact-checking charity Full Fact, has now released a report outlining its work and finding uh, and findings from the first six months of its partnership with the tech giant. And if you don't recall, about two months ago, Snopes, yes, that's Snopes. Snopes actually discontinued its uh, its partnership with Facebook. They're still, you know, Snopes is still doing what they do. Facebook is still doing what they do, but they're just no longer partnered. Looks like they are partnering with other firms, though. So the organization published 96 fact checks during this period, and of these, 59 were found to be false, 19 were a mix of truth and lies, 7 were found to be opinion, and 6 were judged as satire, where just 5 of these posts were marked as true. Think about that. And obviously, if a post gets to the point where a fact-checking consortium or organization uh, is going to look into it, there's going to be something very suspicious on the on the face value of that quote unquote fact. Uh, you know, obviously, if someone types the sky is blue, they are not going to fact check that. These, you know, so the, it makes sense why there are sixty, really like sixty percent are f straight out false, and another like eighty percent were found to be a mix of truth and lies. And even less than that were proven to be, you know, either true or just satire. Something very curious has to be about that, but still, it's a very large number to those that are, you know, very, you know, marked as true. The post ran the gamut of current affairs from misleading political information to false statements about vaccines. As the time reports, much of this dubious information also came with a high health risk. One post claims heart attack victims should cough repeatedly and very vigorously until help arrives. Hmm. Uh, the British Heart Foundation has debunked this advice, and yet the post remained live on Facebook. I had never heard about that, and I, I am remiss that I've read that on the air now, uh, to cough repeatedly and vigorously if you're having a heart attack. Uh, yeah, I don't think, and I guess the reason there is that you're hoping that the muscles tighten around your chest and I guess keep blood pumping, but that really won't do anything for you. So obviously it's been debunked and it's no longer uh, no longer good advice. So you can see something innately is that, really kind of innate is that, I mean, no one is like, hey, I'm gonna earn money by telling people to cough a lot when they're having a heart attack. This is my ticket to fame. No, that's, this is not gonna be an end, an end positive result for anyone. It's just bad information being spread to a large audience. So the problem appears to lie largely with Facebook's algorithm. Full Fact Director Will Moy says that they are not yet at a stage where they can I'm sorry, reliably identify information that is inaccurate. Furthermore, information flagged by the algorithm and then confirmed as false by fact checkers remains on the site although its reach is reduced by more than 80%, which is kind of strange. I I guess, just you know, kind of thinking about it personally, I guess it's okay to say that, hey, this is false, and let everyone still see it. Like, not even reduce its, uh, well, it will kind of passively reduce its audience, or at least the amount of people that see it, if you mark it as false, because people will, you know, kind of innately go, well, if you put some kind of badge on it or if you qualify it saying that this was proven to be mostly false or this was fact check and it was found to be untrue, you can see where that people wouldn't be as likely to share if there was a big badge on it that said not true. So it will passively reduce the amount of people that are actually exposed to the information. But I would rather more people be exposed to that information that is marked clearly false because then it kind of gets their the gears turning their head thinking their brain 
mulling it over that, hey, not everything I read online is completely, uh, yeah, is completely legit. There you go. So uh, the report also found that while Facebook has extended its fact-checking program, the more country, uh, yeah, they said that, uh, uh, the report also found that while Facebook has extended its fact-checking program to more countries and languages, it needs to scale the volume of content and speed of response. However, full fact is, uh, does note that the fact-checking initiative is worthwhile, and it is likely that something similar may be needed on other internet platforms as well. Ultimately concluding that we want Facebook to share more data with fact-checkers so that we can better evaluate content we are checking and evaluate our impact. Yeah, it's um, another problem is just that false information spreads very, very quickly. It, it, it really only takes a, one person with access to a couple dozen fake accounts, bot accounts, or pages with you know, lots of fake traffic and kind of fake uh, statistics that a lie travels much faster than the truth, especially if the if that lie is very incendiary and is very uh, is very eye catching, if you were, and especially when it comes to things like politics, if you report something that is very uh, disturbing to you, you are more likely to kind of share that, say, "Hey, everyone, check this out," than it is, "Oh, nothing happened and it's okay." You're not going to share that whatsoever. It's just the nature of the beast, and I hope that they find a way to combat this. It's just going to be very, very hard. Uh, just Again, a, a lie travels much faster than the truth. So, there you go. Okay, uh, that's the end of that article. We have time for a couple of more. Let's go ahead and talk about... Um, okay. Let's go with this one. Ars Technica. And this is a big shout-out to PlayStation 4, who just hit 100 million sales and yeah, they're going to put it into context, saying that here at ours, we, have, uh, we haven't been putting a lot of regular time and effort lately into updating ours readers on the continuing sales but between Sony, PlayStation 4, and Microsoft Xbox One. And by the way, that might be because, well, the PlayStation 4 outsold the Xbox One very, very well, very handedly. So, they said that it has been abundantly clear for a while now that Sony's system is heavily outpacing Microsoft in worldwide sales. In fact, the PS4 is still outselling the Nintendo Switch on an annual basis, despite being many years older. Hmm, didn't know that one. But with Sony announcing last night that the PlayStation 4 has passed 100 million sales mark in under 6 years, we thought it was worth putting that 9-figure milestone into some context. And, yeah, there's, uh, it's very, very interesting. So let's go ahead and talk about this. 67 months, as we just said, PlayStation 4 sold 100 million units worldwide. Check that out. 69 months, so just two months more, the PlayStation 2 sold 100 million units. And really, when you, when you talk about some of the best consoles ever, the PlayStation 2 always comes up. It's, it's so many people's favorite. Everyone had one. The PlayStation 2, uh, the fact that the PlayStation 4 is outselling the, or at least outpacing the PlayStation 2 is very important. Uh, 79 months, so just one year longer. Wii, not the Wii U, which was not as successful as the Wii, but the Wii original console sold 100 million units. And then last, lastly, the PlayStation original sold 100 million units in 113 months. Uh, so, and by the way, lots of numbers here. If you'd like to check this out, we'll have the article up there. Uh, you know, a lot of different, uh, numbers and months and things like that. Uh, just some more highlights, the game, uh, the Nintendo DS, the, the dual screen sold hundred million units worldwide in just 51 months. Uh, the Game Boy and Game Boy Color, it took, uh, 134 months to sell 100 million units worldwide. Although there were less people playing video games back then, I assume. Uh, let's see, so some of these other ones, um, <laughs> interesting numbers, uh, yeah, I think we're, we're going to go ahead and wrap that up there, but big thing, PlayStation 4 has sold over 100 million 
units. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. And, and of course, there's uh, there's a lot of room to grow. And PlayStation 4 is not out is not out of production yet, but we are looking probably in the next year or two at a new PlayStation console. As we mentioned, PlayStation 5 is right around the corner. So uh, we'll definitely talk more about that in due time. Now, uh, let's go ahead and talk about it just real quick. Um, this one made the rounds yes, uh, yesterday, I want to say, or the day before. Uh, a lot of them, or a lot of the media, really latched onto the idea that, hey, Apple and Siri are listening to people... Uh, <laughs> have maritals or they are listening to drug deals or things like that and in my head i just couldn't help but think wow they love this angle when it comes to passively listening technology and don't get me wrong there there have been cases of, of abuse where uh, individuals are targeted you know if uh, someone knows someone and they know uh, exactly where to look then law enforcement will go in and look for records of certain people or uh, the software engineers are going in and looking for exes of theirs or family members or friends and looking for that data very specifically. But overall, Apple is not listening to people make drug deals. It's just not happening. But this article went around, so let's go ahead and get into this real quick before the end of the show. And it has to do with none other than uh, ZDNet saying that Apple, Siri, overhears your drug deals and, well, sexual activity, a whistleblower says. Saying a quality control frequently comes across recordings which should not exist in the first place. And, you know, it happens. Because, so really, my understanding of this is that the artificial intelligence tries to digest everything that is, I guess, kind of captured by these microphones. If you're saying, uh, not going to say the key phrase just to make sure that uh, no one's phone wakes up, but using the key phrase, uh, tell me what the weather is this week, or uh, what you know, what are the headlines, or whatever command that you could think to give a digital assistant. The system kind of does what you ask of it, and they compare it to their known algorithm, and they say, there's a 100% chance I know exactly what is going on here. Perfect. But on the other hand, if you accidentally turn on your, uh, your Siri or your Alexa or your whatever, if you accidentally turn those on and then you have a mumbling speech because you're not speaking directly to the digital assistant, if you are... Uh, only making noises in the background, the artificial intelligence, the algorithm, will then flag it and saying, I have 0% idea what this conversation is saying. Take a look at this. And then they'll have their researchers, they'll have their, uh, their software engineers go in, listen to the flagged recordings that they have no idea what they are, you know, because um, every other command they know, exactly. You know, the Siri knows what to do with it. But in this case, they don't. So that's when security researchers, or not security researchers, but uh, software researchers will go in and manually write down or input the information as to what it is. And they can say disregard, or we need to work on situations where uh, this person had a very thick accent and therefore the digital assistant didn't pick up well on it, or there was background noise, we need to improve uh we need to improve our digital assistant when someone is riding a train or in a car with the windows down or something like that. It gives them it gives them information on how better to improve their digital assistant. Apple does this. Amazon does this. Google does this. Anyone with a digital assistant does this. This is not shocking. This is not weird. It just so happens that sometimes, like I said, it could be uh, your digital assistant is automatically triggered uh, by accident. You could be having a drug deal in the foreground, which, by the way, we don't encourage. Do not deal in drugs. But you could be having a, a drug deal in the background, and, hey, uh, it's recorded. Because anything that you say with that, uh, you know, with, uh, with these digital assistants on in the background, if it's activated, it will record what you're saying be it uh, nonverbal communication, be it uh, conversations that should not be shared with anyone else, it's just going to record. And 
really, that's kind of the, I don't want to say it's the end user's fault. If nothing else, that information is also very important to Apple because it says clearly uh, this conversation was not meant to be recorded. Why did our system activate? Why did our system record that when no one was explicitly speaking to our digital assistant? So obviously this article made its rounds on social media and the, in, in, in the news organizations. For the security researchers who are saying, hey, you really need to pay attention to this. Hey, you need to be careful about, uh, you know, these tech companies are recording all of your conversations. Not at all. They are not recording your conversations. They are recording when they feel they're being spoken to. And if anything is captured, it's not on purpose. It is by accident unless someone, unless a human is actively trying to uh, collect information on someone else. It, this was just this was a story that really got under my skin and we'll probably talk about it more tomorrow with uh, with our correspondent so everyone thank you so much for tuning in to computer america we are just about done for today i want to thank you so much for tuning in thank you for listening to us on irn thank you for checking out computeramerica.com because i know that you're going to do that and in the meantime everyone 4 p.m to 5 p.m friday or monday through friday every day of the week until next time have a great day thank you so much Bye bye